hello, hello, welcome, welcome. Please type in the chat. I see some of you already have. I know you've been on many screenings this week, I can tell. So those of you who are joining us new, please type in the chat where you're joining from today, how many people are watching with you, and if you are able, an acknowledgement of the native, the native land which you occupy. Again, please uh, come check in here in the chat uh, where you're joining from today, including the native lands which you occupy and how many people are with you. We'd love to see this uh, virtual theater fill up with your voices. Great. We've got Liz from Westchester, Timothy in Orlando, Seminole Territory, Bob from Evanston, uh, Kelly in Old Town of Chicago, Portage, Michigan, Bocce, Cheryl in Pittsburgh, um, Pittsburgh, Kansas, uh, Janice in Naperville, Harshall in Chicago, Jim in Oak Park, uh, Loretta, also in Westchester. Welcome all. Sabrina in Reno, Nevada. Tony in Chicago. Carol in Oak Park, just her, Potawatomi Nation. Uh, Faye in Chicago. Kristen in Chicago with another person. Danny in Lenape Land. Rochester is in the house. Thanks, Norman. Uh, two of you in Barrington. Thanks, Steve. Gosh, this is awesome. This room is really filling up. I can't even keep up. Hi, Rachel. Great to see you. Thanks for being here. Brooklyn, New York. Uh, Highland Park, Sam in Chicago. All right, let's keep checking in and I'm going to move us forward, but don't let that deter you from checking on in. I'm Anna Garcia Doyle, the executive director of One Earth Collective, which produces the One Earth Film Festival. Welcome to this festival screening event. We hope it will provide us all with rich opportunities for learning, a brave and safe space for important conversations and a way to move from inspiration to action. We could not do this work without the support of our sponsors and partners. So thank you to the Moeller Family Foundation, Merrill, a Bank of America company, Riley, Unglob, and Burke, the Nature Conservancy, the Village of Oak Park, the Village of River Forest, and Collective Resource Compost. Thanks also to tonight's hosts and venues for your partnership, Shed Aquarium, Chicago Park District, McKinley Park, Edgewater Environmental Coalition and Andersonville Chamber of Commerce hosting with Philadelphia Church Chicago, Go Green Park Ridge, Park Ridge Youth Commission and Park Ridge Community Health Commission hosting with Maine South High School. Another quick note, if your circumstances allow, please donate to support One Earth's nonprofit year-round screening events, youth programs, and more at oneearthfilmfest.org. We gratefully welcome you to One Earth's 11th festival season, and we invite you to join us in turning the tide on our climate crisis. The festival uses the power of film to create a sea change on topics of environment and those intersected with environment, like racial, social, and economic justice. This year, we've adapted a hybrid format where all screenings are virtual, with some accompanying in-person events taking place in the Chicago area. Whether live or virtual, we remain committed to our unique model of gathering and community to raise awareness of the issues, engage in dialogue, and be inspired to act. A powerful image and call to collective action in light of this year's festival theme, Turn the Tide, are the words of Japanese writer Ryanosuke Satoru. Individually, we are one drop. Together, we are an ocean. Our event will take place in four parts. Soon, we'll introduce you to some folks who'll help us have a rich discussion after the film. Then we'll watch the film together. After the film, we'll unpack its themes in a facilitated dialogue with our panelists. Please use the chat to share your thoughts, ideas, or questions. We'll end by sharing concrete actions you can take to be part of the solution. These suggested actions come from our panelists and action partners. I'd now like to make a few brief acknowledgements. The first is that as we reframe narratives around justice, environment, and equitable solutions to our climate crisis, we acknowledge the many filmmakers, film subjects, facilitators, and panelists joining this and other fest events. Thank you. Your wisdom and experiences help us spark and sustain actions for the protection of our one earth and for the just treatment of its resources and its people. The second acknowledgement is that One Earth Collective is based in Chicago, the traditional homelands of the Council of the Three Fires, the Odawa, Ojibwe, 
and Potawatomi nations, and home to many other tribes, including today, peoples from over 100 tribal nations. Despite this, there are currently no federally recognized tribes in Illinois, due in part to colonization, relocation, and genocide. One Earth sustains its commitment to presenting films that center indigenous stories and voices. We believe that beyond acknowledging the native lands we each occupy, we must lift up indigenous voices and support the work of First Nations groups. If you're in the Chicago area, please support the important work being done by the American Indian Center Chicago, the Chicago American Indian Community Collaborative, Shy Nations Youth Council, and others. And watch for the Field Museum exhibition, Native Truths, Our Voices, Our Stories, co-curated with collaborators from more than 100 tribes opening this May. A third acknowledgement is that shared agreements can help keep our conversation safe and respectful. Please observe the following agreements when participating. Put aside your preconceptions, acknowledge your privilege, internalize what you've learned, approach the conversation with respect, engage your active listening, use I statements and get comfortable with your own story. One last thing before we meet our facilitator and program participants. If you're active on social media, tell people that this is happening. Amplify these voices and be a part of the community we're building here together. The hashtags for the festival are hashtag OEFF2022 and hashtag Turn the Tide. And now I'd like to turn it over to our facilitator to introduce themselves, the panelists, and our film. My name's Doug Dixon, and I'm streaming in today from close to the mouth of the Chicago River, which is the ancestral home of the Potawatomi people. And I am terribly pleased to be with you this evening as a facilitator for this great screening and post-film discussion. I've been associated with the One Earth Film Festival now for several years, and the primary reason I do this is because I look at community and the One Earth Film Festival as a form of a force multiplier as I seek to preserve and protect the small blue orb that I live on and that all of us live on called the planet Earth. That's why I'm here. That's why we're here. And let's get on with it. Uh, I think Anna mentioned that we've got not only a virtual audience streaming in to watch this uh, screening tonight, but we also have four in-person locations uh, joining us uh, watching streams on big screens. And those locations are the Philadelphia Church, hosted by the Edgewater Environmental Coalition and Andersonville Chamber of Commerce, Maine South High School, co-hosted by Go Green Park Ridge, McKinley Park Fieldhouse, hosted by Shed Aquarium, and Shed Aquarium, hosted by the Shed Aquarium membership team. Let's take a couple of seconds to shout out all of the people joining us physically and virtually. Good evening and welcome to the One Earth Film Festival showing of The Plastic Bag Store um, here at Philadelphia Church. Special thanks go to the Edgewater Environmental Coalition, uh, Philadelphia Church, and the team from One Earth Film Festival for making all of this possible. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Laura Wilkins and our film festival is being sponsored by Go Green Park Ridge and the Maine South High School Environmental Club and we are viewing today from Maine South High School in Park Ridge. Hi, my name is Edward from the Shed Aquarium, and this is Elena, and we are at the McKinley Park Fieldhouse. Hi, everyone. I'm Hi, my name is Edward from the Shed Aquarium, and this <laughs> So good, we had to do it twice. Uh, it is wonderful to have both an extended uh, virtual audience and in-person audiences. And we're looking forward to seeing you again after the movie screens. Um, the One Earth Film Festival, what attracts me? What do we do? You know, many times we go to movies and it's a simple entertainment, you know, kind of disconnect from the world, plug into whatever it is that we're watching, a couple hours to go have a conversation and a beer and it's over. The One Earth Film Festival has a different model uh, we think that films are an excellent way to stimulate ideas, stimulate feelings, and that those feelings can lead to action. And that's the point of the Winter Film Festival, to show topical and impactful films that hopefully lead to action to help us stop the degradation of this planet. So we look forward to you joining not only the watching this great film, 
um, but enjoy in participating in the conversation after the film with both the filmmaker and some powerful panelists. I'd like to introduce a couple of our panelists at this time. <clears throat> the first one, Paloma Paez Combe from Environmental Illinois, excuse me, Environment Illinois and the Coalition for Plastic Reduction, Paloma. Also like to introduce Jacqueline Wegner from the Shed Aquarium. Hello, Jacqueline. We'll learn more about them after the film. But at this time, I am terribly pleased to introduce, uh, wow, artist, filmmaker, award winner, environmentalist, um, to introduce her film, <laughs> Plastic Bag Store, the film, Robin Frohart. Robin. Hi. Hi. Thanks for having me. And thanks, everybody, uh, for joining. Um, Doug, I should be introducing the film, right? Telling people a little bit about what they're about to see? A little bit, yeah. So this is the Plastic Bag Store, the film. For those of you who don't know, the Plastic Bag Store is a larger project. It's an installation. It's a fake grocery store normally set up in a real storefront. And everything inside is made out of plastic bags and trash. And, and we tour this show around. Um, and during COVID, we we made a film uh, version of the, of the puppetry narrative that we tell inside this installation. Um, and so that's what you'll be seeing. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you, Robin. Um, just a few quick important notes before we move to our feature film, so to speak. Um, the feature film will be pre preceded this evening by a stop motion 1.5 minute film from one of our young filmmakers uh, called The Plastic Ecosystem by Steffi Gran. Uh, we also would like to invite our in-person audiences at Philadelphia Church, Maine South and McKinley and Shed to put your phones on airplane mode, not just on silent, because we don't want to compete for the bandwidth with the streaming Wi-Fi. So if you put your phones on air, airplane mode until we get to the uh, chat portion, that would be wonderful. <clears throat> uh, that's it. Now let's enjoy the film. Uh, I think it's about 57 minutes. Please stick around for after the film for a great conversation with both Robin, Paloma and Jacqueline. Without further ado, Plastic Backstore, the film. Welcome, <clears throat> and thanks for coming back um, after this is a stimulating and informative uh, screening event. A quick but important piece of housekeeping. Um, we've got in-person audiences uh, in several places. We've got people participating in the chat. We'd like to keep everyone connected. So in-person audience members at Philadelphia Church, Maine South High School, McKinley Park, Fieldhouse, and Shed Aquarium, please take a minute to scan the QR code that's going to be displayed on the screen shortly to be part of the discussion for chat. So as you input to capture this QR code that'll connect you to chat. When you ask a question of the filmmaker or the panelist, uh, please prefix your question or comment with the abbreviation for your location. That would be EA for Edgewater Andersonville, GGPR for Go Green Park Ridge, MCK for McKinley Park Fieldhouse, and SA for Shed Aquarium. So let's give it a couple of questions, see what we've got coming in out there. Kayla, oh, how unique, sad, and provocative. Bravo. Bonnie in the wild woods of New Hampshire. Thank you for this. Julie DeVout, so good it makes me sigh. These are great comments. Great, great comments. Got a question for you. Um, and it's interesting to see what sticks. What are some of the scenes, people, or lines in the film that you remember? It's been been, been 60 minutes since it started. What scenes, people, or lines do you remember from what you've just seen? Well, I'll share mine. Uh, I think I am most impressed with Thaddeus's mother's comment about what is a way? Where is that? <laughs> and that's going to stick with me forever. Telling a group of artists, the story and art was amazing. Absolutely arresting. Unbelievably clever. It's the best film I've seen so far. Way to go, Robin. Tally group of artists. Absolutely arresting. These are okay. 
Come on, give me some lines. What did you see in this movie that arrested you? That cunning temptress convenience. Ooh, mean, mean. <laughs> the ending custodian. Yeah, Helen. Helen on the front and back end. Most valued customer. Yes, because <laughs> the culture of most valued customer. What remains after we tell our story? Yep. I guess you guys are watching this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's the motto of our consumer driven culture. I got it. <laughs> I got it. Well, let's give it a couple of seconds. Uh, and hopefully our in person audiences will have uh, clicked their QR codes and be ready to join in the chat. I have the pleasure of bringing back some expert panelists and a really expert filmmaker uh, who can help answer some of our questions and address our comments for the next few minutes, maybe 20 minutes or so, uh, starting with the filmmaker, Robin Frohart. I will read this because I'll hack it if I do it off the top of my head. Robin Frohart is a film and theater maker, plastic bag store, the film. Robin is a film and theater maker who uses puppets, films, and installations to tell tragic comic stories about the banalities and absurdities of modern life. Her specialty is using simple materials, often trash, to create meticulous worlds. Robin Frohart. Our next panelist, Paloma Paez Kuhn, who is an associate at Environment Illinois and facilitator for the Coalition for Plastic Reduction. Paloma works as an associate with Environment Illinois, where she leads their work to pass policies to reduce single-use plastic in our environment. She also facilitates the Coalition for Plastic Reduction, a statewide coalition of organizations working to advance plastic reduction policy. And last, but by no means least, Jacqueline Wegner. Jacqueline is a director at of uh, director of conservation action. Excuse me, at the Shed Aquarium, where she mobilizes individuals, communities, and businesses to take action for animals through activities like restoring local habitats, opting for sustainably sourced seafood, and reducing their plastic use. Thank you, panelists. Thank you for joining us uh, on a very critical topic. On a Night, you could be doing something else. But we'll start with a few questions for our panelists. <clears throat> if you've got some in our uh, in person and virtual audiences, please feel free to throw them in the chat room. But I will uh, we'll start with some that we talked about earlier in our discussions. Uh, let me start with Robin. This is a terribly rich film, as you very well know. I've told you this several times, uh, that sparks thoughts leading to actions. I was impressed with how many different themes I picked up in the movie, and I figured you probably had some important messages that you didn't get to include in 57 minutes. <laughs> what were some of the messages that you have had to leave on the cutting room floor? Well, um, I don't know about messages, but there are certain, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm an artist, and so I'm always wanting to keep working or keep adding. And um, the one thing that I didn't get to do was include, I really wanted the vase to appear in the far off future um, in some way, like the vase from act one and, uh, or for it to be like in the museum as well, but like just as like a pen holder or something <laughs> that like, it didn't have it wasn't on display where our plastic was so that was that's to me that's like the missing piece is that the vase doesn't make a, a reappearance at the end but we do have the uh, letter earned so that's sort of yeah, an yeah. application yeah. of yeah. sort of an application of the vase funny how reuse uh changes over the millennia um let me ask my other panelists Jacqueline was there anything that struck you in your viewing of this uh, feature that didn't strike you before you saw it? Well, uh, thanks for the question, Doug, and for having me here tonight. And um, I am just blown away by the use of art and just a creative medium in this film. Um, you know, as somebody who works on conservation and works at an organization, Shed Aquarium, that is focused on the environment, sometimes we can get kind of stuck in a bubble, you know, thinking the same way about the same things. And um, 
We are, you know, trying to do what we can to tackle plastic pollution from a lot of different angles, but there's just something really special about a creative project like Plastic Bag Store that just makes you think differently. So that's really what struck me about both the exhibit. I was able to see it when it was in Chicago a couple months ago. Um, and then about the film that uh, really brings these stories to life and makes us just think differently, like you said, about what is a way or what is reuse. Um, and that's just, uh, yeah, what I really appreciate about this film. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Paloma, did anything strike you uh, that you'd like to reinforce or amplify for our virtual and in-person audience? Yeah, I mean, similarly, this, you just get more more out of this film every time you watch it. Yeah. Um, but I think um, this time through, I was really thinking about the ideas of what we value, and there's sort of part of the, the funniness of it is the cognitive dissonance between um, seeing something that seems low value now, like single-use plastic, uh, placing a higher premium on it in the future, um, as sort of a historical artifact. But, you know, I think that also gets at the fact that we are actually making decisions in valuing that every single day with, um, the decisions that we make as consumers, the decisions that we make as society and placing, placing value on convenience or placing value on single use, um, above value on our lives or the environment or whatever it is. So, um, yeah, I was thinking about the way that this film speaks to the things that we value every day. The goddess of convenience. It's some great lines in this movie. Thank you, Robin. Um, it seems like we're all, um, somewhat impressed or impacted by this form. Um, the, the almost comical way that it approached this terrible message. I remember when I was a member of the Glorious Now and not very environmentally conscious, I always thought that climate change was something other people should do. Um, so it's fun to, to actually be involved in trying to make a change. And I think movies like this move me more than reading dry facts. Let me go back to Robin. Robin, what made you pick puppetry as a form for communicating the messages that you want to get out? Yeah, I think, I mean, it's a form that I've worked on in, in for many years to tell different stories, not, not always just about this particular subject matter. Um, but I think that puppets are a really good tool for storytelling because they're, they're already metaphors uh, in a way. They're like metaphors for humans. Um, and so they're great storytelling tools in that, that way. It's like a, a, like a puppet on a stage is an everyman or something. It already is like this symbol. And so it's really easy to um, have empathy for that character. It's also like as an audience member, you know, like, like Helen is, she is just like, wood and cloth and paint, you know, she's not a real person, um, but she is only alive in your imagination. Like, so um, however she exists in your imagine in your imagination, like you are actually bringing her to life. So all of her feelings are your feelings and all of her reactions are your reactions. Like it's an entirely empathic thing that's happening when you're watching a puppet. So I think that, um, people are very like uh, engaged and connected and um, <laughs> open in a way when they're watching puppetry versus um, other, other forms Act actors on a stage, you're, you're judging them as another human being. You're not like, Oh, this is an actor playing somebody, but you're not, you don't think that there's an actor playing Helen. Like Helen Ooh. really is Helen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I hate, to, I'm not, I don't hate to say it. I'm proud to say it, that, that this media seems to cut through uh, I think Paloma called it dissonance that, you know, when you read the numbers and, you know, listen to somebody talk a talking head doesn't cut through, but this, this kind of gets straight to the subconscious and the messages launch in. Uh, looks like we've got another comment in the thread from Bonnie in the wild woods of New Hampshire. Uh, she's interested in understanding how you Robin pulled together the puppeteers, actors, and writers to take mm -hmm. this really important topic and make it palatable, amusing, and heartbreaking? <laughs> well, I will say that it was a very, very long process. Uh, and, <laughs> uh, it, uh, it didn't all happen all at once, and I didn't have that whole story in my head and then was like, now I just need to tell people how to make it happen. I, you know, I think 
Um, I had been working with uh, the that team of puppeteers. I had another play called The Pigeoning, um, and I had assembled a group of puppeteers for that play, and we had worked so long on that. We had really uh, uh, developed our own visual language and how to be that Boon Recoup style puppet tears together and work together as a team. And so that having that team of performers already was very helpful. Um, but it took, it took years of making little, you know, it's, it's several chunks, right? It's like so many different, it's like a bunch of little films all together. So um, it happened piece by piece. And, you know, I think I started working on it in 2016. So uh, it, it was, it didn't happen fast. It, <laughs> It just took a long, a long time, you know, and um, and a lot of very talented folks um, coming on board for sure. All of the music uh, was composed by Freddie Price, who's also did the voice, the voiceover of uh, in Act One and Act Two. And then we've been longtime collaborator collaborators um, as as for years. So um, his his contribution is uh, invaluable to this production. Thank you. Um, short answer, a lot of work is how you pull yeah, this Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, let me pull some of my other colleagues in um, and not talk so much about the, the film per se, but the topic of the film. I'm trying to figure out how to massage several questions into one, um, but I'm not being very successful. So I'll just paraphrase. Um, I can't even read this one, but I'll. one of our participants wants to know, we are told that plastics are often recyclable, but researchers tell us that very little actually gets recycled. What can we do to change that? That sounds like a question for Paloma. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, great question. Um, the truth is that most single-use plastics are designed to have one life, and a lot of the messaging around recycling comes from the plastics industry that wants to keep producing these plastics. Um, so while recycling is good for some materials, there are other materials that we just shouldn't be creating in the first place. So supporting advocacy efforts to ban some of the worst forms of single-use plastic, like polystyrene foam, um, like single-use uh, thin plastic bags, um, that can be really impactful. Um, and then I think another thing that's really being recognized right now in the policy world is holding producers responsible and accountable for the products they produce, um, whether that's paying for the recycling programs to recycle the things that can be recycled, um, and then you know associating higher costs with the things that are harder to recycle, that are um, worse for the environment to incentivize moving away from those materials um, and to ultimately incentivize reuse over single use. Great. That is, uh, I think that's the new horizon. Uh, although I'm careful. I, I noticed when I was a member of the Glorious Now uh, and a proud member of the Consumer and Throwaway Society, I always thought it was somebody else's job to take care of this stuff. You know, I could live whatever hedonistic life I wanted, but the away was somebody else's problems. But I now have to worry about the downstream uh, because it's my world too. Thank you, Paloma. Uh, Jacqueline, <clears throat> on the subject of making changes and single use. Plastics. Uh, you are on the vanguard of how plastics impact wildlife. What are some of the changes that we can make to change what feels like a throwaway culture and to create more opportunities for reuse? Yeah, that's a tough one. You know, we've been kind of laughing about the um, you know themes around disposability and what is a way, um, but our culture is really kind of built up around convenience at this point. And so it's, a, you know, a big shift to consider ways that we can, you know, revert back to some of the things that were more environmentally friendly that some of our grandparents and great grandparents were doing, but um, not only, you know, some of those, um, you know, past practices, but we have a lot of innovative opportunities in the future too, that we can um, look to, to reduce, our uh, dependence on disposable plastic. Um, one of the things I'm really excited about um, is a pilot project that we're going to be supporting in the Andersonville neighborhood. So shout out to the folks at Philadelphia Church in Andersonville um, and, uh, and a small uh, new company called Encora. It's E-N-C-O-R-A. 
they're going to be partnering with a number of restaurants in Andersonville on a reuse system for the uh, for restaurants. So you can order to go orders um, in reusable packages, and then you'll return them, and then they'll continue to you know be in a cycle of reuse instead of just getting tossed forever. Um, there are uh, some great pilot projects in other cities that have already stood these kinds of things up. So we don't just have to use disposables for to-go wear. Um, we're looking at reuse in, in some of these things, especially in things like a restaurant industry or some of the systemic level reuse than just putting on the, on the individuals as Paloma was mentioning earlier. We have to kind of level up the change that we're making. Okay, so we'd have to both engage at an individual level and think of upstream, downstream and start putting pressure, not pressure, but influence the people that are making profits from destroying the planet. Thank you so very much. Um, one of the themes that we had discussed earlier, uh, <clears throat> which is obviously a hot point of mine, is how do you balance uh, individual responsibility against, you know, corporate, government, um, big systems efforts? You know, people like me 10 years ago thought I had no individual responsibility to the environment. Uh, me currently think I have a huge responsibility. Everything that I do impacts the environment in some way. That, But there's still a role for community and corporations and government. Can you say something, since I got your center screen, Jacqueline, on how that balance, how to balance that tension? Yeah, um, of course. You know, I, one of the pollution Pollution. And it really does take all of us to recognize the plastic crisis that we're facing and to um, to take action. One of the things that I do love about this film is that, again, it's a creative, artistic approach. And I'm sorry, I think my internet might be in and out a little bit, so hopefully I find some stability. Can you hear me okay, Doug? Okay. Um, to see artists recognize the plastic crisis and say, I want to create a piece of art or something creative that can help spread a word and, and get people thinking differently about this challenge is huge. If artists can um, you know, find their place in um, addressing the plastic crisis, I would love to just invite everybody else. You do not have to do this as a career, but whatever your job is, whatever your role in life is, whatever um, you know, role you play in your community and your family, what is the way that you can you know, make a difference within your space and use your skills, use your expertise, career, whatever that is, um, to make a difference? Because you do not need to do this as, as your full-time job. We need everybody of all, um, all backgrounds to, to jump in and figure out what their role is. Excellent. Uh, Paloma. The topic of balancing individual versus corporate probably res resonates with somebody that lives in the uh, policy world. Can you speak to that balancing act between what I can do as an individual and what I expect bigger uh, units to do? Yeah, I mean, so much of the crisis that we find ourselves in right now has been caused not by individuals, but by large corporations. And so um, I think there's this, there's a finding the balance between um, creating like large scale change and then individuals doing their part. Um, but I don't think that those two things uh, go against each other at all. I sort of see it as a ladder. So like, you know, maybe um, picking up, picking up plastic trash in your own neighborhood is the first thing that you do. Um, and a way for you to get involved in this work. And that's important, bringing your own reusable water bottle. That's like another example. So those are the kind of individual actions. And then maybe that will lead to you like engaging in a neighborhood cleanup. Maybe that will lead to you like getting involved in an advocacy organization and writing a letter to your legislator to create policy change. So I think all of these things fit into each other. And a lot of times the sort of individual actions that seem like they might not be enough alone, um, are a ladder to get people to build up into larger scale change and are a way for people to add their voices together um, to really call for decision makers uh, collectively to, to make more sweeping, longer lasting change. Okay, thank you. Uh, Robin, um, did you have a point of view you'd like to share with us on this individual versus corporate responsibility for earthkeeping? 
<laughs> well, definitely, I definitely blame the corporations for sure. I think, you know, they're, they're, they're the ones that are making it, you know, and I think that, um, you know, I think we do all have to do our own individual part, but I also think that like there is, sometimes that's a very hard ask, you know, there, uh, it's also like a, a privilege, a, a place of privilege to be able to like afford fancy all the fancy, cool, reusable stuff that, you know, that I really like, you know, that's always advertised to me because the algorithm knows what I want. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, there is a certain, like, you know, there's a barrier, uh, for some people to, to live like that. Oftentimes there is no alternative to, uh, the way things are packaged. Um, and it often, it's the cheaper option, you know? So I definitely like, um, I think, yeah, I think, you know, people do have to, you know, people, our consciousness will have to shift and change and people will make their own changes. But I think, you know, with, I'm we're looking at things on, on a bigger scale and trying to just give us a bigger understanding of how we fit into the world or how we are a part of this long chain of human history uh, and to give us context. And I think that like, you know, we, we have to sort of, collectively understand the issue first, you know, and we have to like change hearts and we have, there has to be a cultural shift too. Um, uh, and then I think that, you know, corporations will realize it's not what we want and stop marketing it and stop producing right. it. I don't yeah, know what that is, but I also. Yeah, the people that buy it, stop buying it. Yeah. And the producers that sell it have an incentive to change. Yeah. 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 But it has to be all the stuff all at once, you know, yeah. and I don't know what, which one is is best you know like i i definitely like want to do my part but i definitely don't want to like shame people for what they're able to do in their own lives um because it sometimes okay. feels insurmountable or yeah well we can all do a little bit i think and that's what that's i encourage cool. people to do Everybody. yeah and, um, I think, and i think doing one thing leads to the next you know if there's like one thing yeah you like carry your own water bottle that's an easy one uh and then you start to notice like oh i actually now I could carry my own fork, you know, or something. like I think that it can build in this way. It builds. You know? Yeah, I would never have imagined 10 years ago uh, when I started on this journey, I guess about 10 years ago, that I'd be as environmentally conscious as I am today. It's like my parent, my wife and family thinks I'm crazy. Uh, yeah. Why'd you put that? Yeah, don't buy that. Buy the other thing. Why'd you throw that away? It's kind of obsessive, but yeah. it starts with me. Thank you so very much. Um, Gata, I, this is a hard one but I have to go there. Um, and I don't want to shut you out, Robin, but you might not be able to answer this very well. So I will shift it to Jacqueline and Paloma. Uh, bring it local. I've gone kind of global. Let's bring it local. Uh, what are some of the things that are happening in the Chicago region, where both SHID um, and the Wonder Film Festival are headquartered, in terms of trying to combat the issues that we saw in the film? Uh, and are there any for lack of a better term, success stories that you could share that might be replicable in other places. I'll start with Jacqueline. That sounds good. Thank you. I think it makes sense for me to start. And, you know, part of uh, what's great about this panel and, you know, we collaborate a lot with Paloma and we need to, um, yeah, make change at different levels. So I think this will be kind of a good handoff. Some of the things that come to mind for me are, the wide variety of groups that lead cleanup efforts around the Chicago area. There are so many. And I know that that is downstream. And we've kind of been in this conversation talking about the need to move upstream. But through cleanups, we're not only we're making a little bit of a dent in, in cleanups on the Chicago River and the Lake Michigan shoreline and um, also parks and neighborhoods throughout the Chicago area, because even land based litter is likely to be washed or blown into waterways. So anywhere you can do a pickup is, is helpful. Not only are we kind of making a dent in um, actually getting litter out of the environment, but these, the awareness that uh, and the, the impact that you have through those experiences is huge because when people see Doritos bags or plastic bottle caps when they're doing a cleanup, they start to make the connection. I use these things. So if I use this and it's ending up in the environment or in a landfill or in an overflowing garbage can that then ends up in the environment, so anyway, cleanups are really, they're, they're big, but especially as an educational and an outreach tool. Um, we also are starting to see more and more innovation with 
businesses and in communities to figure out solutions towards, um, you know, getting our, our businesses away from as much um, disposable plastic. Um, one of the things that Shed Aquarium has been doing for the last couple of years is organizing the restaurant industry around reducing their plastic. And I mentioned the pilot with Encora, but we also, um, outside of just the reuse pilot, we've um, been organizing a number of restaurants. We actually have over 165 who have joined our Let's Shed Plastic program. And so these restaurants are joining us to get educated, to understand how they can reduce plastic in their operations, and to learn a bit about how um, reducing their plastic use is not only good for the environment, it's better for human health and for their bottom line, especially with so many to-go orders the more disposable cutlery that they can, you know, keep from giving out, they're going to save money in the long term if, if they reduce their use. Um, so, yeah, we the, the Let's Shed Plastic program is another cool Chicago area effort um, that we're bringing people in to say at that level, we want to um, help to drive some change. One of the exciting ways I'll kind of pass it over to Paloma, we're also inviting those restaurants to raise their voice as business owners and as, as community leaders to say they they know they can do some change within their own um, operations, but they need to help to inform the policy change and they need to push for it and drive it. Um, and so with some of our restaurants that want to be more engaged beyond just making a difference within their walls, we're passing them over to the coalition that Paloma is overseeing that is um, helping to organize not only environmental orgs, but elected officials and business leaders like restaurants to uh, work on policy change. So maybe I'll uh, pass the baton over to Paloma to share what else uh, is going on in the Chicago region. Sounds like a great baton pass. Paloma, tell us more about what's going on at the policy level in Chicago, in the Chicago region that is. <clears throat> yeah, thanks for that segue, Jacqueline. Um, so unfortunately there has not been much progress on the policy level in the Chicagoland area. Um, a lot of you might have seen a, a single-use plastic by request only policy passed in Chicago last summer. Um, that is a little bit sort of below the, the, the lowest hanging fruit <laughs> um, and uh, unfortunately has no enforcement mechanism. But I think one success story uh, coming out of the past couple of years has been this, this coalition, this great coalition that's come together, the Coalition for Plastic Reduction. Um, that I've been facilitating for a while now. Started out um, organizing around Chicago policy and we've now ex expanded to, to work on more state level policy. Um, but we've wor been working uh, mostly towards source reduction policies um, to get rid of, get rid of single use plastics at their source. Um, and then like Jacqueline mentioned, we've also been working to organize restaurants and business partners who you know, have sort of already recognized that single-use plastic is a problem. Many of them have already eliminated a lot of single-use plastics from their own business operations. Um, and now they're interested in informing and advocating for policy. Um, and I think that's a really important step is, um, as we're considering a lot of these to get restaurant input on the way that they're worded um, and then to work with restaurants to advocate for policies that are going to, going to affect them. Um, as well and, and recognizing that their business voices are a really important part of speaking out for, for creating a more plastic free world. Thank you. So there's lots going on and there's lots of opportunities for more to go on. Um, before we shift into a hard pivot for action, um, had a couple of, I won't say softball questions, but softer questions. Um, besides art, where did the question go? This is for every panelist. What other tools do you think are critical as we work to address what seems like insurmountable problems when it comes to waste, um, especially plastics waste? What other tools do you think are critical? I'll start with you, Paloma. Um, I think, sorry, I'm getting a little hoarse. Um, I think really <laughs> connecting people with, um, with ways to get involved in advocacy efforts I, something I hear a lot in my work is frustration that folks um, feel like they're doing their part and they're not sure how to get involved with actually creating policy change. Um, so I think uh, doing public education is really important, engaging people in different ways, and then 
letting people know that they have a voice with their decision makers and um, can can speak up for policy change and can have an impact that way. Let me quickly follow up with you, Paloma, before I ask my other panelists. Uh, Alex Kester asked, <laughs> loaded question, are there any politicians or legislators that are particularly allied to this plastics issue that we should support? Um, well, I'll give a shout out to the two sponsors for our um, our polystyrene foam ban bill. Um, Representative Jennifer Gong Gershowitz and Senator Laura Fine have been leaders in helping us uh, to work on this bill. It would ban just one of the most harmful forms of single-use plastic in Illinois. Um, at the federal level, we have Merkley and Lowenthal who introduced the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act, which is a really uh, visionary piece of policy um, at the federal level that contains a lot of what we want to see moving forward around plastics policy. Um, so those are just a couple of legislators that can mention. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jacqueline. Can you remind me the question, Doug, just so I can stay focused? Oh, I got to remember my own question. <laughs> <laughs> or I can share what I was thinking about as, as Paloma. All right, I'll go there. I can jump into it. Well, so <laughs> I was thinking about how plastic it is still kind of seen as, you know, you've re referenced a couple of times, it's maybe somebody else's problem or a certain type of person's problem. And, um, you know, a lot of us are trying to draw the line between, you know, the front of kind of the, the upstream and downstream. So plastic in its production, it's made out of fossil fuels. The production of plastic itself is a, a, a highly polluting process. And then we use plastic and plastic contains toxins that can leach into our food, get into our systems. And then plastic is a problem at the downstream end, which of course we've talked about today a bit. Um, and so as we understand the full life cycle of plastic we can see that it's impacting human health in a lot of different ways. And I think the more that we frame, you know, the problem of plastic pollution as um, like a human health issue, it's going to help us to understand um, how it's impacting people at, at different levels. And then on top of that, um, you know, we, again, we've been talking a lot about a throwaway culture today, but are we talking about the disposability of plastic, but we also are a lot of ways treating communities or people as disposable, especially for the countries where we're shipping all of our stuff, it's expecting that they're going to process it, do something with it. A lot of these countries don't have recycled infrastructure, and then they are just with, with our junk. And so this is really an environmental justice issue as we understand you know, how how our waste is being managed globally and how we are really putting the burden on certain communities. And so the more we can kind of recognize both upstream, downstream, how that burden is on certain communities, we, we can really get the scope of the full context of this issue and, um, and recognize that it's not just a certain, uh, you know, environmentalist type of problem, but um, really takes action at different levels. Okay, very good. Uh, I'm very conscious of the time. I think Anna uh, has asked that we really do try to get us out of here by 30. And the point of One Earth Film Festival, and I think Robin's point in making the movie, uh, is to inspire people to do things differently. So if I could, uh, let's segue to our action phase. Uh, I appreciate everyone's comments, part engagement and participation. Uh, if I wasn't able to get to your question, there are ways to stay in touch with us uh, that we'll talk about shortly. But for now, uh, let me set the stage. There is a, uh, a beautiful woman who was uh, named the Poet Laureate for this country. I think her name is Amanda Gorham. She did a great poem uh, at Biden's inauguration. And there's an excerpt um, that we use uh, in the One Earth Film Festival. I am nowhere near as dramatic a reader as Amanda, and I'm certainly not a writer, but I will share it with you now. There is no rehearsal. The time is now, now, now. Earth, pale blue dot, we will fail you not. This is a time. Um, I grew up in a Baptist church. We always, you know, it's time to open the doors to the church where I'm soliciting people um, to engage in actions to help save this planet that we all work on. So as a final question to my panelists, 
Um, can you think of specific, give me one, one specific thing that any person could do to address the issue of plastic waste? What's the most important thing they could do? Start with uh, Jacqueline, because I got her center of my screen. Uh, I know we talked about a bunch of actions today. The yes. first thing that came to yeah. mind, though, is to find a community. Find the people to work with. I'm so inspired by the people who are at McKinley Park and in Park Ridge, um, at Shed and in Andersonville. And so I would say find community and work with other people and support each other. And um, there's so much that we can do when we amplify each other's actions. Thank you. That was my favorite community. Um, however, I think Robin's got some cool stuff because she just collects plastic all the time. Robin, one good idea. People yeah, or I, communities or institutions. Well, I don't know if I have the best idea, but uh, oftentimes when I get asked this about like, well, how can we live without this stuff or what, you know, like it seems like there needs to be some um magical new scientific uh, solution, which I'm sure there does, but I often will ask people that like, we don't have to imagine the future. We can kind of look to the past. Like you can ask your mother, like what, you know, what, how did she, she didn't dehydrate and she didn't buy bottled water constantly. Right. Like, (laughs) you know, um, you know, people have been able to feed and hydrate and transport port things around the world, you know, for thousands of years. Um, this single use uh, plastic is a, is a very new thing that it, it, like it's, it's taken over, but it doesn't seem impossible. We can also learn from the past as well as imagine the future. Learn from Thaddeus. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I don't uh, know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Paloma, are you out there? Uh, give me, give me one. Doesn't have to be the best. Just give me one action. Corporate or individual that we can yeah. use to implement? Yeah, I'd say contact your legislators, give them a phone call, write to them. Um, a, a lot of times you'll just get a like an answering machine. You'll leave a message and you might think it's going into the void, but I can't tell you how many times I've been in a meeting with a legislator about a particular issue. And we had done, we had like gotten members to make calls to their office the past couple of weeks. And they'll say like, you know, oh my gosh, I, this wasn't even on my radar and I just got 20 phone calls about it and now I'm going to support it. So it adds up. It matters. Legislators do listen to those. Um, so contact your legislator, get in touch with them and make sure that it's on their radar. Thank you. Um, to me, there's a theme here talking about this stuff, connecting with people. It's not just an individual act. The more we engage, the more we're all force multipliers. So Thank you, panelists. Uh, thank you, filmmaker. Uh, you have been wonderful and insightful. Appreciate your time. Uh, but we're going to do a power close. <clears throat> Taking action is still the topic of the One Earth Film Festival. And the panelists um, have put together a list of things that we can do. I'd like to highlight some of them to take action. Uh, probably the most important one for me is connecting. So there's a topic called connecting with nature. Um, something as simple as just getting outside, getting your feet in dirt away from the plastic, talking to people is a great way to figure out what's going on in the real world um, and connect with it and, and support it. Uh, another thing that I've noticed, we got another, uh, could you do the next? Yeah. The, uh, Live lightly on the earth. This is probably my favorite because this is what I wasn't doing. I was living as heavily as humanly possible. Um, But mostly I could think about the consequence, carbon footprint, waste production, and make incremental changes to my life. And I strongly recommend everybody do this. Shed Aquarium has programs to help us think about that. Uh, Communicate and learn. I hate to give a shameless plug, but I am shameless. There is a book discussion group being run by the One Earth Film Festival and some great friends of mine. Um, Beginning next week, sign up at One Earth Film Festival for the book, All We Can Save, rich discussion led by some tremendously deep women. Uh, And to reinforce Paloma's point of view, use your voice. We have important things to say. Uh, Talk to your neighbors, 
Talk to your legislators, talk to your stores, talk to your restaurateurs. Uh, if we had more time, I'd tell you stories about all the restaurants I've gone to and given them grief about single use plastics and gone back and they've changed. Funny how that works. So at any rate, those are some of the actions that we've talked about. Please, please, please take some action. Stay in touch. We'll keep in, tr excuse me, keep in touch with our panelists, both at Shed and Environment Illinois. I am sure Robin will continue to produce movies that we can see. In the coming days, we will share um, a tape, so, sort of taped version of the proceedings minus uh, the film screening so you can capture some of the details. So we will send this out to you via email, uh, especially on the take action points and a transcript of the chart of ideas that we shared. So last but not least, I got two whole minutes here. Um, I hope you feel called to participate in what the One Earth Film Festival uh, is attempting to do. And that's inviting us all to turn the tide on environmental injustice and degradation. If we could please um, fire everybody up on the way out the door, so to speak, fire into your chat. What actions will you take to help turn the tide on our climate crisis? What actions will you take to turn the tide? My chat box is not filling up. <laughs> okay, I know what I'm going to do. It's the least comfortable thing I've ever done. And that's go have a not go aggressively seek out conversations with people that don't believe, that think climate change is a hoax. And I typically avoid them, but it's now that time. I, I need to bring them in. <laughs> so that's what I'm going to do. Never buy another plastic bottle again. Go, Susan! Julie, you can come see me. Find my community. I love this. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, we've got a survey. Um, so there's a quick survey you can participate in. Please, please, please let us know how we are doing. <clears throat> so last but not least, it is 8.29 and 40 seconds. To learn more about our panelists, please stay in touch with their work. See the links on this slide. Remember to tweet, post, or share what you just experienced online and in social media and share your experience in the survey. If you found value in today's event, please, 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 please donate to the One Earth Film Festival and join us again later on this week. We still got two fun and fact-filled days of the film festival. Tomorrow is the uh, Young Filmmakers Contest, which is always stimulating. Uh, so please, please, please continue to participate and we will be doing our normal Earth, uh, Earth Day week celebrations here in Chicago. Again, thank you all, Robin, Jacqueline, Paloma, um, the entire community, McKinley Park, all of you gather, all hundreds of people that have gathered tonight to watch this great film. Uh, as my one of my television heroes once said, live long and prosper. Be well. <laughs> Good night. And thank you, Doug, for facilitating. It's been great. Thank you.